Now let's just bow and ask for God's blessing on our time together tonight. <clears throat> our Father, we come into thy holy presence uh, this evening in the precious name of the Lord Jesus. We thank thee we can sing, that we can stand upon the promises of God. We thank thee for something that is firm in a world that is always changing and where the word of man is so untrustworthy. We give thanks that we can rest on a God who cannot lie and a God who makes promises and fulfills them. And we give thanks that all the promises are fulfilled in Christ. We thank that he is the Savior. He is the Savior of sinners. And we praise thee that for everyone in this room tonight who can say that they're trusting in him and they have the assurance of salvation. And we are gathered tonight to look at a subject that is so important and we pray that as we do so, we may hear thy voice speaking to us and through thy word. And we pray that each one of us might not just be uh, perhaps uh, know more about the subject when we leave, but we pray that each one of us may have heard thy voice speaking to us and that each one might be blessed, that Christians might be encouraged, that those who've never trusted the Savior. Tonight, it may be the night when they make that great decision and turn to him in faith and know that they're standing on the promises of God. So we pray for thy help and blessing tonight. In the Savior's name, amen. amen. Now, we're not going to sing another hymn, because I always go over the time, so I'm trying to keep within the time, and there's a lot of material to talk about tonight, so I hope you'll pardon me just getting straight into it, and uh, we'll have a hymn at the end, uh, I, I hope. <laughs> well, thank you again for coming. It's lovely to see everyone here, and if it's the first time you been along to these meetings, you're, you're very welcome and it's lovely to see you here. We're going to talk uh, tonight about what has been called the longest hatred, uh, anti-Semitism. Someone wrote a book actually entitled The Longest Hatred and uh, just reflecting the fact that anti-Semitism has been around for a long time and we're going to think about that this evening. Um, this is not, I was saying to somebody walking along the road, this is not a political meeting. <laughs> Uh, it's not that we're uh, pointing fingers at any political party. Uh, I think we're going to find that uh, every party and every society has been guilty at some time of anti-Semitism. Uh, and this is not just some kind of talk so that we will learn how not to be prejudiced to other people. That's not the, the point of it at all. The point of it is that we're going to discover something, I think, tonight about anti-Semitism that is unique. And something that affects us and all, we might think, well, I, I don't know any Jews and uh, I'm not anti-Semitic and I don't put tweets uh, on, online or Facebook posts that are anti-Semitic. You might think it's nothing to do with me, really. It might be interesting. Dear friends, that couldn't be further from the truth. What we're going to talk about tonight affects every single person in this hall. So it is something that is on uh, the agenda today, I mean, it's, it's, it's quite amazing that this has been going on for a long time, but it's bang up to date. And you just need to lift your newspaper or, or watch what's happening or listen to the debates or think about the political scene to know that anti-Semitism is very much a hot topic today. It is also, worryingly, a growing issue. Anti-Semitism in Europe is growing at an alarming rate. You would think we'd have learned a few lessons by now, but in this particular subject, we never seem to. And so this is not something that's historical and it's past and gone. It's something that's going on today. And I want to just show later on, it's something that's going to reach a, a head in the future. But just before we <clears throat> uh, begin to look at the subject, I want to turn to the Word of God, the Bible, and I want to read... A passage, here it is up on the screen. It's the book of Exodus, chapter 3. You might remember from your Sunday school days, Moses and the burning bush. You remember that story? Moses, keeping his sheep, discovers as he walks along, here's a bush on fire. There was nothing really remarkable about that. The thing that was remarkable was that it was never being burned up. It was burning, but it wasn't burning up. And I just want to read this. And Moses looked, and behold, the bush was burning. Yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside, God called to him out of the bush. 
I just want to say three things about this very briefly. First of all, what does this bush that burns but is never burnt up, what does it symbolize? Well, it symbolizes the nation of Israel. When Moses saw this bush burning, Israel was in Egypt, slaves, being oppressed, being persecuted. They were on fire. But the amazing thing was, as Moses looked at this bush, it was burning all right, but it was never, go- it was never consuming the bush. And so here is a picture right away. And Moses, he says, I'm going to look into this. And he turns aside to see this great sight. Dear friends, I was thinking about this. That's just what we're doing tonight. That's just what we're doing tonight. We're turning aside and we're going to have a look at this great sight. And the amazing thing is this, dear friends, when Moses did that and stopped and thought, I'm going to have a look at this, it was then that God spoke to him out of the bush. And it's my prayer, and it's the prayer of all the Christians here, that as we think about this burning bush that's never burnt up, as we think of Israel and its sufferings, and yet it's never extinguished, it's never, it's never consumed, and we turn aside to have a look at it, and it's our prayer that God will speak to us out of the bush. And when we learn something about this, that we'll hear the voice of God calling to us out of the burning bush. I want to think about this in four ways. Ask four questions, really. First of all, what is it? Just very briefly. And then secondly, how has it appeared in history? We're going to take a a real run through the, the centuries. So I hope we can all keep up. I hope I can keep up. And we're going to think thirdly, what is really behind it? What, what is behind all this anti-Semitism? And then we're going to think, finally, uh, we're going to draw it into ourselves. How does it affect me in Och tonight? So let's just think about this. What is it? Well, just the word Semite. It comes from Shemite. And Shem was one of the sons of Noah, according to the Bible. And he was the father of all the Middle Eastern countries, the Middle Eastern races. So actually, the Semitic peoples are not just the Jews. The Semitic peoples are the whole of the Middle Eastern uh, races. However, this uh, expression, anti-Semite, was used in the 1800s for the first time. And it became not about all the Semitic peoples. It became uh, an expression, a description of something that affected the Jews only. So when we think of anti-Semitism, there are other Semitic races, but only the Jews. When we talk about anti-Semitism, that's what we're thinking about. It affects only the Jews. Everyone agrees. Collins Dictionary says that anti-Semitism is hostility uh, to and prejudice against Jewish people. There's another description or definition The International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance in 2005 came up with this, and this is the one that they're having all the debate about in the Labour Party at the moment. It says, anti-Semitism is a certain perception of Jews which may be expressed as hatred towards Jews. Rhetorical and physical manifestations of anti-Semitism are directed toward Jewish or non-Jewish individuals and or their property toward Jewish community institutions and religious facilities. It goes on to describe acts that are anti-Semitic. Just to get it into our minds, I think we can just condense it to say this, that anti-Semitism is hatred toward Jews. That's it. Basically, that's what it is. It's hatred toward Jews. That's what we're going to talk about tonight. Now, you might say to me, well, hold on a minute. People do talk like this. They say, well, this is just like racism. You know, black people have been discriminated against for years and in other countries there are certain races that are persecuted by others. And they might, there's nothing new in this. There's nothing unusual about anti-Semitism. It's exactly the same as other forms of discrimination in the world. That is not the case. Anti-Semitism is a unique form of persecution. I just want to briefly tell you why. First of all, because of its longevity. We're going to discover that this hatred of the Jews goes back thousands of years, and it's bang up to date today. It's something that's been with mankind almost from the very beginning. It has been with mankind right from the beginning of the Jewish nation. When the Jewish nation was formed, 
the first thing they had to contend with, as we're going to see this evening, was anti-Semitism. It's been a long time. Universality. This is not something that's just appeared in the Middle East or something that's appeared uh, in Europe. It's something that's appeared all over the world. It is, there's hardly a country, there's hardly a continent where there has not been some form of anti-Semitism, some form of hatred toward Jews in its history. Intensity. There are discriminations against different races. That is true in the world. But the Jews time and time again have been singled out for genocide. The, the avowed intent of anti-Semites is to get rid of, to annihilate the Jews. And so it's unique because of its intensity. And I want to say too, it's unique in a sense because of its mystery. If you read, just look up a few articles, if you will, uh, on the internet or take a few books out of the library. You'll see that historians are divided on just why this happens and, and what are the reasons, what are the causes. And, and people are scratching their heads, and maybe we're scratching our heads too a bit tonight. But they're scratching their heads and wondering, why is it? that uh, this kind of hatred towards Jews has been so long-lasting and so universal and so intense. And there's a bit of a mystery about it, and I hope we'll be able to dispel some of that mystery this evening. So that's what it is. It is a unique form of persecution. It's hatred towards Jews. It has been around a long time. It is universal. It is intense. And there is this idea of what is really behind it. That's what we're going to think about this evening. I want to just think now about how it has appeared in history. And we're going to, we're going to run through uh, quite a few centuries here, so get your skates on. When did Israel become a nation? Now you might debate this, you might debate this. Israel, of course, the word Israel, the name Israel, comes from Jacob. Jacob was the man, uh, one of the patriarchs of the Old Testament. God changed his name to Israel. He had 12 sons. They became the sons of Israel. They became the tribes of Israel. So really, you could you can trace it back further, of course, right to Abraham. But you could actually say that the father of the nation of Israel probably was Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. You might know the story of Joseph. Joseph was taken captive down to Egypt. And eventually, uh, the 12 sons of Jacob and their families, and Jacob himself, moved down to Egypt. They lived there for a number of years. And this is where they began to multiply, to grow, and to become not just a family, but actually a nation. And it was 1571 BC, the first form of genocide was when the Egyptian pharaoh decided that these Jewish people were getting too mighty, too strong, too many, and so he made an edict that every male Jew that was born would be thrown into the River Nile. And it was a deliberate attempt to halt the progress and the multiplication of the Jews and also eventually to assimilate the nation into the Egyptian nation. That's the first, I think, you could maybe not call it anti-Semitism, but persecution against Israel. Well, through its history, and I'm just jumping over now to 775 BC, there was the Assyrian invasion of Israel. And Israel now has been split into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah. And Assyria is taking Israel captive. And the idea is to attempt to assimilate them into the nation. So in other words, you know, sometimes this works in two ways. You can try and annihilate the Jews, or you can try and break down their differences so that they just melt into the country. That's what they tried in Assyria. Then it was the turn of the southern kingdom, Judah, and 588 BC, the Babylonians came and they besieged Jerusalem. Jerusalem was sacked and the Jews were taken away into Babylon. The Bible's full about this, uh, lots of information about this. The Jews were taken down captive into Babylon by the rivers of Babylon. You remember the, the psalm, we sat down and we wept when we remembered Zion. And they were taken away captive. And again, the idea there was to bring them into the Babylonian society. They changed their names, they changed their education. The young people, they tried to bring them up, not as Jews, but as Babylonians, because they wanted to melt the Jews into Babylon. That's the whole idea. Now we're jumping forward a bit. We come to 510 and we remember the story in the book of Esther in the Bible of a man called Haman and this is the Persian attempt to annihilate the race 
of the Jews. Haman was an Agagite and he planned to annihilate the entire Jewish nation. You can read about it in the book of Esther. And so he had a plan on a certain day that the people in the kingdom of Ahasuerus, the Median kingdom, that they would rise up against the Jews and just basically take their lives and take their property and wipe out. He was the first Adolf Hitler, you might say. And of course, if you read the story of Esther, it's an exciting book. Read it! When you read the story of Esther, you'll find that uh, what happened was this God overruled in a very wonderful way. And uh, a man called Mordecai was able to bring the news in and Esther was able to deliver her people. And it is celebrated even today. The Jews celebrate the Feast of Purim. And it is uh, the, the celebration of the fact that they escape the murderous clutches of Haman. Well, we come along now. We're coming into the period between the Old Testament and the New Testament, 175 BC, the Seleucian period. And there's a man called Antiochus Epiphanes, wonderful name, and not a wonderful man, Antiochus Epiphanes. And he was a tyrannical persecutor of the Jews. And he tried to uh, uh, Hellenize the Jewish nation. And what he did was this. He erected in the temple in Jerusalem. By this time the Jews are back in their land. They're back in Jerusalem. He erected a, a, an idol of Zeus. Uh, the Hellenistic God. In the very temple in Jerusalem. Which was anathema to the Jews. And he went further. And he took some pigs. And he slew them and offered them on the altar in the temple of Jerusalem. You will know that for a Jew the pig is an unclean animal. And this was accompanied by a murderous onslaught against the Jews. And it gave rise, you probably heard about the revolt of the Maccabees. It gave rise to the Maccabean revolt. And, and uh, that ended in bloodshed on a massive scale. And this was another attempt to attack and to oppose and to annihilate and to assimilate the Jewish nation. To stop, to cease to vanquish their existence as a nation. He was a bad man. Then we're jumping now into New Testament times. And here the Lord Jesus has been and he's died and he's been raised from the dead and he's gone back to heaven. And he prophesied that this exactly would happen. AD 70 there was a revolt and um, the Roman general Titus came and they besieged the city of Jerusalem. And they starved it out and eventually they conquered it. And they destroyed the city. And they tell the historian Josephus says that they actually denuded the forests round about. They cut down so many trees. Why? They cut down so many trees because all the roads from Jerusalem were lined with crosses. And they crucified all the Jews that were in Jerusalem. And Titus, interesting this, Titus gave orders that the temple shouldn't be destroyed. The soldiers were convinced that the Jews had hidden gold. And the rumor went round that they'd hidden it in sheets between the stones of the temple. Jesus said there will not be one stone upon another. And the, the Roman soldiers actually took literally every stone off. Because they wanted to find the gold. And the words of Jesus were fulfilled. Well, the Jews were then scattered abroad throughout the world, and this became uh, known as an, an era of the wandering Jew, because now they were away from their homeland. It would be centuries before they're back again. And now we enter, and we have to put this in inverted commas, the so-called Christian period of persecution of the Jews. Uh, a man called Constantine, who was the emperor, uh, was converted. There's a lot of use of inverted commas here. He adopted Christianity, probably for political ends. And suddenly, instead of being a persecuted minority, the church went to a favored majority. And everyone wanted to be a Christian. And people were just wholesale converted to Christianity. It was a political, it was if you wanted to be on the right side, you become a Christian. So everyone became a Christian. None, very few of them, I imagine, were born again, were saved, were trusting in Jesus Christ. They're not real Christians at all. They're, they're, they're as Christian as this, as this glass of water. But uh, nevertheless, they took the name of Christ. And what they decided to do was, in their blindness and stupidity, professing to be followers of Jesus Christ, they began to look at the Jews and say, these are the people that killed Christ. And so what is happening to them is just God's judgment and we can join in with it. 
And so they began to oppress the Jews and refer to them as Christ killers. And Justinian was another emperor who did the same. And then Augustine, who was a theologian, backed it up with his teaching. And so you're suddenly getting this... uh, incredible situation where followers of Jesus Christ, can you imagine it, who was himself a Jew, followers of Jesus Christ are being encouraged to persecute the Jews. And this opened up a a, a long period where the Jews were going to suffer dreadfully at the hands of so-called no more Christians than the clock on the wall, mind you, but, but uh, so-called Christians. Dear friend, make, it your, make, it your, uh, make sure of this, that you distinguish between professing Christians and real Christians. 1095, we've jumped forward a few years, the Crusades. The Crusades were, uh, it was just some kind of uh, uh, political adventure and, 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 and way to, it was, uh, it was a way to gain wealth and, and, and to go on the rampage basically. And they started sweeping across Europe and the, the stated aim was to liberate the Holy Land from the, from the Arabs and the Muslims and so on. Uh, but on the way, they decided that they would teach the Jews a lesson. And in Germany in particular, in 1095, Massive bloodshed, massacres on a wide scale against the Jews because they were the killers of Christ in this perverted, twisted uh, theology. The Fourth Lateran Council of the Roman Catholic Church decreed. Now, wait a minute. Have you heard about this before? They decreed that every Jew should wear a badge. It's quite frightening, isn't it? Decreed that every Jew should wear a badge so you could pick them out in the street. So if you wanted to persecute them, you couldn't hide if you were a Jew. And of course, Adolf Hitler just decided on the same, on the same uh, uh, procedure when he came uh, to power. But here are the Jews, and it seems that wherever they go, and there's a ma- I could have put up a map of Europe showing the different movements of the Jews, that they'd be expelled from one country, they moved to another, they persecuted there, they move on somewhere else. And it was a, an era of dreadful persecution. Coming to our own island... Edward I of England, we have to say. Edward I of England. At 1290, he made an edict that all the Jews would be expelled from these islands. And this resulted, dear friends, in there being hardly any Jews in the United Kingdom, or at least in England, for the next 400 years. It was the time of the Puritans before there were any Jews back in back in. in in, uh, England. They were being persecuted, discriminated against, and eventually they were completely expelled from England by Edward I. 1478. Are you keeping up with all these dates? I'm not going to ask you at the end. The Spanish Inquisition. The Jews were mercilessly massacred, and those who survived were eventually expelled from Spain. I would say probably, reading the history books, the expulsion from Spain of the Jews was the the largest and most, if you could almost say, industrialized persecution of the Jews in that era in Europe, until there was no Jews left at all in Spain, and Spain was a massive center of the Jews at that time. We're moving forward now. 1543, Martin Luther. I say this with tears almost. Martin Luther, four years before he died, he wrote a book, The Jews and Their Lies. Martin Luther thought, you know, he discovered, rediscovered salvation by faith and and, and broke away from the Roman Catholic Church. And he thought that once the Jews realized this message, they would accept it, but they didn't accept it. So he turned against them. I'm not going to quote from his book. His book is absolutely dreadful. And it just shows the, the, the pervading, the pervasive view at the time that these people were responsible. Let me just make this absolutely clear. If Christ had come to Scotland, the Scots would have crucified him too. You realize that, of course. The Jews are just a sample of humanity. There's nothing inherently wicked about the Jews that's not wicked about us. If he'd come to our our land, we wouldn't have received him either. And uh, sadly, men like Martin Luther and their words were picked up later on by, by those who wanted to actually carry out persecution of the Jews. And it's a dreadful story. It really is. We come up to the 1800s in Russia. 
the Russian Empire, the pogroms of Russia were notorious. These were times, the word just means a revolt that ends in massacre. And these were times when the state encouraged and aided and abetted different communities in different parts of the Russian Empire to rise up against the Jews. Basically, give them a free pass to do whatever they wanted. Give them a blank check to do whatever you want. And it resulted in, this is not too long ago, 1881. It resulted in, in thousands and thousands being killed. Well, here is a sample. Now we're moving into the, the late 1800s, the early 1900s. This is the kind of caricatures of the Jews that were quite common in the press. Uh, they were seen uh, as being racially inferior. They were seen as being power hungry of money was the big thing. Let me just say this. In many countries in Europe, the Jews were forbidden to own property. So if they had wealth, what could they do with it? All they could do was lend money. So the, the Gentiles, the non-Jews, were very happy to go to them for the loans, but they hated them for it. And so they, 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 they spun this web of, of deceit and lies and propaganda that the Jews, all they were interested in was money. And uh, that, uh, that they were these, uh, and of course you don't need to read, you just need to read uh, William Shakespeare. And you'll think of Shylock getting his pound of flesh in The Merchant of Venice. And uh, if you read Charles Dickens, you'll find there's some anti-Semitism there. And, and some of our greatest works of literature that follow this period are tainted by anti-Semitism. And then, of course, it came to the worst of our era, the worst outbreak of anti-Semitism. It just was left for a man like Adolf Hitler to pick up the, to pick up the cudgels. And he said this long before he was in power. Once I really am in power, my first and foremost task will be the annihilation of the Jews. The final solution, as you will know, I'm not going to talk about this tonight, but the final solution ended with over six million Jews murdered. And the stated aim was to rid Europe and to rid the world of the Jew. It backfired, of course, because Hitler lost the war. And what happened at the end of the war was that Israel went back to its land and was granted its land back again. But immediately, instead of everyone thinking, well, this is wonderful, the centuries of hostility and hatred are over, instead of that, here was an outburst now of Arab hostility. And so the nations round about Israel that have still to this present day have sworn to wipe Israel off the map. And so it just seems to go on and on and the circumstances change and the reasons change, but it's still the same. The hatred is still there until we come to our present day, present day anti-Semitism. And where you find this is you'll find it on the left. That's quite amazing. You'll find it on the right of politics. And you'll find it in Islam. And you'll find, and the statistics are quite frightening, there is an increasing trend of anti-Semitic uh, posts online, articles written, um, actions, um, uh, riots, actual reported uh, persecution, this is increasing all the time. So you've got this picture, well uh, it's not a present picture at all, but you've got this picture of this nation who right from the beginning, they were almost strangled at birth, and from their birth as a nation to their very present day, they have been nothing but hated and persecuted and chased and, and disadvantaged and expelled and exterminated and almost annihilated. The bush is burning all right, but the bush is not consumed. I want to think what's behind it. Now, if you read your history books, you'll find there's lots of reasons given. And some talk about economic anti-Semitism. That is, the Jew is seen as the banker. 
the, the, the man that controls the finances and they're greedy and all they want money. So there's this kind of thing stoking up this idea. And then there is what they call social anti-Semitism. That is, the Jew is seen as socially inferior, vulgar, not refined. And then there is racist anti-Semitism. The Jews, and Hitler picked up on this immediately, the Jews are seen as an inferior race that need to be, that need to be cut out of humanity almost. And then there's religious anti-Semitism, whether it's so-called Christian in the Middle Ages and, 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 and later where they, they, they looked at the Jews as those who killed Christ or whether it's other religions who cannot bear the idea that the Jews are some kind of special chosen people. Ideological anti-Semitism, the Jews as a threatening power. You'll find that even around today. The big, the big furore about anti-Semitism at the moment in politics is because people are putting around cartoons and tropes and, and uh, suggestions that the Jews are controlling everything. And so people persecute them because they believe that. Cultural anti-Semitism. The Jew has been seen as a corrupter of society. Well, I want to suggest to you that these are excuses, they're not reasons. This isn't the cause. This isn't the cause. If you look through history, you'll find that the Egyptians did it for one reason, the Assyrians did it for another reason, the Romans did it for another reason, the Russians did it for another reason, the Nazis did it for another reason, Edward I did it for another reason, the Spanish did it for another reason. I want to just try and peel that back and see what's behind it all. And I want to say this. Mankind hates Israel because it hates God. Now listen to this. This was written by a Jew, and he's speaking about Israel. He says, theirs is the adoption of sons, theirs the divine glory, theirs the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, the promises, theirs are the patriarchs, from them is traced the human ancestry of Christ, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. In other words, Paul is saying, do you know how God is speaking to the human race? He's speaking through one nation the Jew. That's very true. In the Old Testament, he gave his word through the Jews. In the New Testament, the Lord Jesus came, the Savior of the world. He's a Jew. Uh, we're going to read in a minute, salvation is from the Jews. All that God has to say, God's message to mankind is through the Jewish nation. That's true. And mankind hates Israel because it hates God. I just want to mention three things. As to the past, God revealed his character and standards. They were the custodians and communicators of God's law, the Ten Commandments and so on. And because subconsciously, unconsciously, behind it all there is the activity of Satan, the enemy, but subconsciously man is attacking Israel because they are the ones through whom God's standard of holiness was revealed, and we hate that. <coughs> and then in the present, the Lord Jesus said himself, salvation is from the Jews. In other words, if you want to be saved, if you want to be forgiven, dear friends, you've got to come to a Jew. And Sigmund Freud said, Jews are hated not so much because they killed Jesus, but because they produced them. And before the Lord Jesus came, all the attacks of Satan against Israel were to try and prevent him being born. And when he was born, and when he died on the cross and rose from the dead, all the attacks of Satan against Israel are because they produced the Savior of the world. And thirdly, as to the future, Israel is the key to God's future plan. When the Messiah returns, Israel is going to become the top nation in the world. And people don't believe that, of course, but Satan knows that's true. And behind these outbreaks of anti-Semitism, I'm absolutely convinced there is satanic power. And Satan is trying to destroy and to derail God's purposes. And he'll never do it. He'll never do it. But that explains to me why the Jews have been persecuted and vilified and exterminated and almost annihilated. Because it's through the Jewish nation God has communicated his standards to the world. It's through the Jewish nation that God has given a savior for the world. 
And it's through the Jewish nation that God's plan for the future is going to be unfolded. And Satan hates it. And that's why anti-Semitism exists. Now you might say, well, that's very interesting. But what has it got to do with me? Well, I want to show you, just as I sit down, number one, three things to take away from this talk tonight. The survival of Israel confirms the Bible. This book is not fairy tale. This book is the Word of God. And the Bible says, no weapon that is formed against you will prosper. In other words, the Bible foretells that the nation of Israel will be persecuted, that they will be hated, that they will be despised, that they will be persecuted all over the world. But it is absolutely firm on this that it will survive. It will never be annihilated. It will never be rubbed out. And uh, somebody was talking to uh, a friend who said, give me, one, give me one reason for that would prove to me the existence of God. And he said, the Jew. The Jew. Dear friends, I don't know, maybe you're not a Christian, maybe you're not a believer in the Lord Jesus. Maybe you come along and you think, well, these are interesting talks, but I don't believe this is the Word of God. The very survival of the Jewish nation is a testament to this, the authority and the credibility of this book. You can trust the Bible. Secondly, Israel is God's, I put up here, timepiece, but then I thought, timepiece, what century do we live in? Israel is God's alarm clock. And it is interesting. If you do your own research, come back to me if I'm wrong. But if you do your own research, you'll find there has been a marked increase in anti-Semitism. You would think after the Holocaust, you'd think after the war, you'd think that we would, we would all have learned how these things end and how dreadful it all is. And yet there is a massive upsurge of anti-Semitism today. Widespread. And this is just a shadow of what is coming. The Bible talks about a time of Jacob's trouble. There is a dreadful experience that is ahead of the nation of Israel, but God is going to save them through that. But the very fact, dear friends, that we see an upsurge of anti-Semitism today is telling us that's an alarm clock going off. God is speaking to us out of the middle of the bush. And God is telling us that the time is just about ready. For the Lord Jesus to come. And the final point, and the most important point, is that my attitude to a Jew determines my destiny. It was a Jew who died for me on the cross. God's Son, when He came to planet Earth, He did not decide. He did not choose to be born an Egyptian. He did not choose to be born a Roman. He did not choose to be born in any of the northern tribes. He chose to be born as a Jew. And he came to redeem and he came to save and he came to die for sinners. And the Bible says there's one God and there's one mediator. And that mediator is a Jew. Between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Dear friends, I just want to say this. I don't know what your attitude to Israel is. I imagine everyone here is quite sympathetic towards Israel. You might hear these stories of the persecution and think, how horrific, how dreadful. You can hardly look at some of these photographs of, of Nazi persecution without weeping. You might feel a certain sympathy for the Jews. But I want to ask you this. Is a Jew your saviour? Is Jesus Christ your personal saviour? The Bible says there's only one way to God, and that is through a Jew. And the Lord Jesus died on the cross, gave himself for my sins, and he rose from the dead, and he's in heaven. And when I was a boy of 12 years old, I didn't know what anti-Semitism meant, but I knew this, that Jesus Christ died for my sins on the cross, and I trusted him to be my Savior. And I'm going to be in heaven one day because... A Jew died for me on the cross, and that Jew was the Son of God. God called to him out of the burning bush. There's a verse in the Bible that says, Today, if you hear his voice, 
don't harden your heart. If you look at the nation of Israel, if you look at the burning bush, you'll see it's burning, but it's not burnt up, it's not consumed. And may God speak to every one of us and tell us quite clearly and personally that this book is absolutely genuine and real and trustworthy. And tell us that the time is coming when the Lord Jesus is coming back because there's a great persecution that's lying ahead. And tell us that there is only one Savior, and it's the Lord Jesus Christ. The man who was born into the Jewish nation and died not just for the Jewish nation, but for every nation, for every man, for every woman, every boy, every girl. And if we come to God, we must come through him. I hope that as we close now, you might just do that. Just trust the Savior. Come to him. Confess you're a sinner. Believe in him. Rely on him. And he will save you. There's one God, one mediator between God and men. And he is the man, Christ Jesus. And he is a Jew. Let's just bow now in prayer. Father, we give thanks for a saviour. Uh, thank you that Israel as a nation has been preserved, but we give thanks there's a greater salvation uh, when a soul is saved from sin. Uh, and we pray, we pray for Israel, we pray for the nation of Israel, we pray for their, for their blessing, but we pray above all that they may come to know the Lord Jesus and that many Jews may come to trust in him. And we pray for our audience here tonight in Och. Uh, we've been thinking about things that maybe have little to do with our everyday lives. But we give thanks that they point us again to the Lord Jesus. And we pray that somebody tonight in this audience may come to know him as their saviour. So we just pray for thy blessing. We thank thee for our time together. We thank thee for the refreshments now in the Lord's name. Amen. Amen. We'll just sing a verse in closing. <coughs> That clock is slightly fast, but I have gone over the time a little bit, so I apologize. We're going to sing 1E, Great is Thy Faithfulness. I don't know if you know that one, Sandy. I don't think we've got the music for it. If not, we can just sing it without the music. It doesn't matter. But uh, I'm not sure if we've got the music for that one. E, 1E. Willie, will you? There we are. That's lovely. 1E, it's pasted in at the front of your, of your hymn book. Great is Thy Faithfulness. Now, can you imagine a Jew singing this at the end of the day? Great is thy faithfulness. And uh, it's very true, but God is a faithful God and we can trust him absolutely. Let's sing the first and last verses uh, after the introduction of 1E, then our meeting is over. Thank you very much for coming.